I'm Ted Seides, and this is Private Equity Deals. This show is an exploration of deals in the private markets. Through conversations with private equity managers, we'll dive into individual deals to learn about deal dynamics, companies, and ownership that make private equity a force in institutional portfolios and the global economy. Season one of Private Equity Deals focused on owners you know. Season two focuses on companies you know. You can keep up to date and join our mailing list at capitalallocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Clients of capital allocators or guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On episode two of season two of Private Equity Deals, Scott Spielvogel discusses the acquisition of Blue Triton Brands. Scott is a co-founder and managing partner of One Rock Capital, a private equity firm managing $5 billion that specializes in ugly, hairy, messy situations. Blue Triton Brands is the business that formerly comprised Nestle Water North America, which collectively has the top market share in North American bottled water. Its brands include Poland Spring, Deer Park, Arrowhead, Pure Life, Origin, and a host of other specialty brands. One Rock carved out the business from Nestle in 2021. Our conversation covers a history of bottled water, attractiveness and risks of the opportunity, and a deal process that started with the banker telling One Rock they were too small to participate. We turn to deal pricing, operational efficiencies upon ownership, reinvigorating brands, new initiatives, and early performance. Please enjoy my conversation with Scott Spielvogel. Scott, great to see you. Good to see you, Ted. Well, we're going to go through Blue Triton. Why don't we just start with a brief history and background of One Rock? Sure. One Rock is a buyout firm. We invest across four sectors of what we call the real economy. So manufacturing, chemicals, industrial services, and then food and beverage manufacturing and distribution. We were founded in 2010 by myself and my partner, Tony Lee. We've known each other a very long time. We were friends in college, played on the rugby team together in college. And before forming One Rock, Tony and I worked together at a firm called Ripplewood Holdings, which afforded us the opportunity to spin out. And we were lucky enough to be able to take many of our team members that we worked with back at Ripplewood with us to join One Rock over the years. And today, One Rock is about $5 billion of total capital commitments. We've got offices in New York, LA, and London. We've got about 90 people in total. And that includes our operating partner team, which is 24 people. And they have either industry expertise or operating expertise in various functional areas. And they work exclusively with us to help add value to the businesses we buy. What's your particular style or flavor of businesses you like to buy? So we like the ugly, hairy, messy situations (laughs) where we can buy a company at a really sharp price and then work on the problems that come with them. Then the idea is once we've gone in and cleaned up those problems and complexities, then we get to go sell at a market multiple. And given the sectors that we deal with, this can be a really unsexy exercise. But for us, it's a tried and true approach and requires a lot of price discipline, hard work to improve the businesses that we buy, but we've been successful at it to date. So we're going to talk about Blue Triton, and it includes some very well-known water branded companies. Why don't we start with what is Blue Triton? Sure. So the company is the business that formerly comprised Nestle Water North America. So these are bottled water brands in North America, which collectively have number one market share. So the brands that comprise the portfolio include Poland Spring, which is popular in the northeastern part of the U.S., We've got Zephyr Hills, which is down in Florida, Deer Park, which is in the mid-Atlantic and southeastern U.S., Ice Mountain, which is the upper Midwest, Ozarka, which is Texas and some of the Plain states, and then Arrowhead out west. 
It also includes Pure Life, which is Nestle's filtered water business, and then a bunch of smaller specialty brands. Well, we're all familiar with water. Love to hear a little bit about the bottled water business. The practice of bottling water goes back actually to the 1600s in the UK and in Europe, where back then it was people traveling around and they wanted to have a known source of water, have a reliable source of hydration. In North America, the first known bottled water business sprung up around Boston right before the American Revolution, mid-1700s. Since then, several regional companies sort of sprung up around North America, including Poland Spring, which dates back to the mid-1800s. And the industry gradually grew over the years. And occasionally you would see demand spike when something would happen to the water supply or there were disease outbreaks or contamination and spring or mineral water was more trusted by consumers. And so that was the reason for its growth over the years. And then there were a few innovations along the way. Somebody figured out how to carbonize water. And then later on, somebody figured out how to put them in plastic bottles, which made them much more lightweight. In the 1970s, that's when things really took off. There was a renewed emphasis on health and wellness among the population. And water was viewed as a beverage that was better for you than soft drinks or certainly alcohol. So that's when it started to take off as this premium beverage that you would even buy a bottle of for lunch. And in the early 1980s, Perrier Group was active in acquiring some North American brands. They bought Poland Spring. They also bought Arrowhead. And then in the early 90s, Nestle bought Perrier and continued the consolidation of these regional brands in North America. And that happened until about 2020 when Nestle decided that they were going to focus on their international brands and hold on to those. And those international brands include Perrier, Pellegrino, and Aquapana. And they decided that the spring water brands that they'd bought in North America were non-core to them. And in mid-2020, they announced that they were looking to divest it. What's the process for taking like natural water that you might drink out of your tap and turning it into a bottled water product? There are filtration plants and there are certain competitors in the industry that will find municipal sources of water and run that water through a filtration plant and give it certain taste characteristics and then put it in bottles and deliver it to convenience stores and supermarkets and warehouses and whatnot. Some of our water brands, to the extent that they're spring water brands, it means it comes from the ground and it has different minerality and certain taste characteristics. It also goes through a filtration process and then gets bottled and delivered to those same outlets. How do these companies build a brand in what feels like it could be a commodity? Yeah, I think there are certain characteristics that come with each individual brand that appeals to consumers. There's perceptions of health benefits to the extent that it's more natural or filtered. Certainly, there are different taste characteristics coming out of the tap than there would be from a filtered water or a spring water. So a lot of the brand is built around the characteristics that the consumers are looking for in that particular case. When you think about this deal, what are some of the things that you think this exemplifies about One Rock and the different characteristics you see in the industry at large? I think it's a good illustration of how we try to pick our spots, first of all, in terms of the types of situations that we get ourselves involved in. If you take a step back, when we sit around an investment committee, we're really looking for three aspects of a deal, which make it a One Rock deal. Number one is that it has to be inherently well-positioned in its particular market. It has to be a leader in either market share or technology or brands, something that is going to make it worth someone else buying from us once we're done with the whole removal of the complexity that comes with the deal. So we're looking for leading companies, number one. Number two is that it has to be improvable under our ownership period. So by setting the business up as a standalone or by leaning out the manufacturing or revamping the supply chain. There have to be tangible things that we think we can do to the business 
that would overwhelm what might happen from a macro perspective. So we obviously study the macro factors for any sector that we're about to invest in, but we don't want to be reliant on the macro to generate our returns for us. So we really want to be in control of that value creation exercise. And so by fixing the problems of the business, we feel like that's a repeatable, sustainable way to generate returns for our investors. And so we look for opportunities that set up well against our operating capabilities. And then third is price. We're value guys. And so eight times is sort of where we cap out in terms of EBITDA multiples for the businesses that we buy. And sometimes it's less than that if it tends to be more of a capital intensive business. But by and large, we're value investors. And so the idea is that in exchange for taking on the complexities of the businesses that we buy, we need to have that margin of safety of price. And so when we go clean up the mess and go to sell the asset, we get nice multiple uplift as well. So you mentioned that Nestle wanted to divest of their US brands. What about this situation made it one of these ugly, hairy things that interested you? So it was a corporate carve out and corporate carve outs come with varying degrees of complexity. No two corporate carve outs are ever the same. Oftentimes businesses that are being sold in a corporate carve out, they don't come with a full management team. Sometimes there are ongoing contractual relationships with the former corporate parent that need to be worked out, either supply agreements or offtake agreements. Sometimes you have to build out your own ERP system, or in the absence of that, you have to rely on the seller's ERP system for a period of time and transition over after a period of time. And so that's another tricky situation. In this particular case, we were not getting a full management team. So we knew we needed to supplement what we were getting in terms of leadership for the organization. And Nestle was in a hurry. They had announced in mid-2020 that they were looking to sell this asset by end of Q1 2021. And by the time final bids were due in January of 2021, it was sort of a sprint to be done. Therefore, there were lots of transition services that needed to be negotiated in order to be able to be up and running as an independent entity from day one. And then over time, we sort of built out our own company infrastructure and weaned ourselves off of Nestle systems. What was attractive to you about the company? So there were a lot of opportunities that we saw as being attractive. The first was the opportunity to premiumize the product lineup. So Nestle had its own set of premium brands. And one of the things that we noticed in our due diligence was that because they were so focused on protecting the pricing of the premium brands, that the spring water businesses were underinvested in. And what that meant was from an R&D perspective, they hadn't developed the kinds of functional waters that would have complemented that portfolio. And by functional, I mean alkaline characteristics or certain flavored waters. There was a little bit of that when we got there, but there was much more opportunity that was underexploited. There was also the opportunity to take this business and actually compete with some of Nestle's premium brands in things like food service. You almost never see Poland Spring offered as a bottled water that you would buy in a restaurant, but there are other premium brands that we thought might be available for sale that we could buy and add on to this product portfolio. And there was a lot we thought we could do in terms of packaging and other innovative solutions that would drive up the perceived value for the consumer. These are all things that Nestle didn't want to do because they were protecting their premium brands. So that was one thing. The other is that we noticed that there was quite a significant pricing gap between Nestle's spring water brands in North America and other brands like Coke's Dasani brand, like Pepsi's Aquafina brand, which are essentially just filtered municipal water. And yet the spring water brands sold at a discount, a pretty significant discount, up to 70 cents a gallon. This is a business that's of quite a big size. We're talking about a $4 billion revenue portfolio here. And the ability to narrow that price gap by one cent would mean somewhere between 20 and $30 million of additional EBITDA. So quite significant. So we thought that by bringing a better value proposition to the consumer, we might be able to narrow that pricing gap. And then the other thing that we saw was the ability from an operational perspective 
and from a strategic perspective to make the business more efficient. So one of the things that we got with this portfolio of assets was about half a billion dollars of owned real estate, which we thought we could sell and lease back on a long-term basis and unlock some value there. We thought we could lower the costs of the bottling operation, the distribution operation, and we thought we could lean out the entire infrastructure of the business. So those were some of the opportunities that we wanted to get after. What were some of the risks you were most concerned about? The risks included the threat of private label. Private label had been growing in market share, certainly throughout the late teens and early 20s. As we headed into COVID, there was sort of a degradation of the company's market share. And part of that was that there were volume declines in addition. And if you think about sporting events and movie theaters that people were not going to during COVID because they were closed, hotels where bottled water is sold, there was definitely a decrease in volumes that happened during COVID. And private label was one of those things where you could go into a Walmart or have delivered lots of cheap water delivered to your house. So private label had been inching up in market share over the years. So that was definitely a threat. And one of the things that we tried to assess was whether by reinvesting in the brand portfolio that we were getting in the deal, whether we thought we could stem that tide and actually change the trajectory to add to our leading position in the marketplace. The other thing that we noticed over time is that some of the costs were very volatile. So some of the key raw material costs that we used in the business had fluctuated quite significantly. So things like fuel and freight costs, things like the cost of PET, which is a commodity derivative for which we blow mold bottles. What we planned to do there was to look for opportunities to lock in the costs so that we could provide a little bit more stability to the cost side of the equation so that when we went about our pricing strategy, we could have it well understood so that we don't find ourselves upside down in terms of cost fluctuations. The third area is ESG concerns. I mean, when you think about what the company does, they take water out of the ground and we put it in plastic bottles. Sometimes those are single-use plastic bottles. We recognized that if we were going to buy this company, we needed to be part of the ESG solution here. And so at One Rock, we have an ESG program where we interface with our portfolio companies to try to set them on the right trajectory. Things like using more sustainable packaging, recycled content of PET. So there is a nice recycled product that we can use and we have, and we think that is something that would help mitigate some of the ESG concerns. Things like making sure that we're good stewards of the land from which we are taking water, we thought would be very important. And so we've gone on a campaign of interfacing with the local communities where we actually source our water from and make sure that we're doing all the right things from the environmental perspective. When it comes to this deal process, you mentioned a few things that Make me think it could be interesting. There was sort of a time pressure. You've got this corporate carve out. Presumably, Nestle, they're spinning something out. There's a formal process. What did that look like from beginning to end? So we first learned about the opportunity in mid-2020 when Nestle announced that it was going to be under consideration for sale. And when we found out who the investment banker was, we called them up and said, hey, listen, we would be very interested in taking a look at this asset. We have a very long history of completing corporate carve-outs quite successfully. And we have a long list of references of big companies that we have transacted with over the years. And we'd really like to take a look at the North American water business. And at first we were told, no, you guys at One Rock, you're simply too small. You're investing a $2 billion fund. This is a huge business, $4 billion of revenue. We think the price is going to be way out of your strike zone. So thanks, but no thanks, One Rock. So we sort of went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, that's not an acceptable answer. We have a really good history of interfacing and getting deals done that are above our strike zone in terms of size. We have lots of co-investors in our LP base that like to co-invest alongside of us. So we sort of appealed from the top of our organization to the top of the investment banking organization. And ultimately, the compromise that was reached was that we could look at the business as a potential buyer, if 
we allow the investment banker to team us up with another sponsor. So the idea being that we would look at it together and be in it together. And that's not something that One Rock had ever really done before, but we sort of played along thinking that things can change along the way. So we just want to make sure that we're included in the process. So that's what we did. We were teamed up with another sponsor. That sponsor ultimately ran into resistance in their investment committee. And at that point, once we learned that the people that we were teamed up with weren't going to be able to follow through on the transaction and even complete due diligence, we called the banker back and said, listen, the guys you teamed us up with, they're not interested in the asset. And the investment banker asked us, okay, so what do you One Rock guys want to do? And we said, we want to look at the whole thing. And when the reaction was one of more relief than it was objection, we knew at that point that the process was not so well attended. It wasn't the fact that there were all these buyers climbing all over themselves trying to get their hands on this asset. Based on the work that we'd done to date, we knew it was super complicated and set up well for us. So we decided that we really wanted to pursue it ourselves. The banker let us in and decided that, okay, Nestle's put out a pretty aggressive time frame here. You're going to have to come up with final bids due January 15th, 2021, so that they can get it sold by the end of 2021. And they want fully financed bids. So you've got to show up with all the money and no due diligence out. So you need to be ready to transact. So that's what we did. So obviously in 2020, COVID was going on. It was more difficult to conduct due diligence, but we found ways to go visit the various springs, the various bottling operations, make sure that we understood the business as well as we should understand a business that we're stepping into. So there was no deviation from our normal due diligence process. And come January 15th, we put in our final bid with all of the co-invests lined up. We were ready to sign an equity commitment letter that was in excess of a billion dollars. Ultimately, what happened is we submitted our bid. I guess there were a couple of other bids. Our understanding is that at least one of those bids was at a significantly higher valuation. However, it didn't have fully financed commitment papers. There were still some due diligence uncertainties with that other bid. Nestle pointed to us and said, we really want to get this done by March 31st. And so One Rock, you guys went. A couple of things in that process. When the sponsor they had paired you up with had resistance in their committee, and then you saw the deal wasn't going to be as well bid as maybe the banker had thought. What were some of those resistance points that you had to get comfortable with that others didn't? Part of it was the risks that I outlined before, just the idea that it was a messy carve out and that we were going to have to bring some management talent to that particular situation. So luckily for us, we have this operating partner team that can fill in some of the holes on an interim basis or tap our networks to try to find people that could fill those roles on a more permanent basis. So after we bought the business, we had two operating partners assume meaningful interim operating roles at the company. And we went on a pretty serious campaign of recruiting leaders of the various business units that we thought we needed going forward. And those are the kinds of risks that not a lot of private equity firms like to take on. It's not in a nice little package. We'll figure out management later is not really an option that a lot of private equity firms like to deal with. What were some of those ways during COVID? You said you had to visit the facilities, you had to do some stuff that is out of the normal course because of that period of time. What did you do? We had a team that went and visited some of the factories. And luckily, because we had so many various operating partners working on this particular transaction, we could sort of fan out and get a lot of diligence done at the same time. So if we needed to visit both California and Maine and Florida, we could do that with separate teams. Some of the biggest challenges during that time, frankly, was the fact that businesses didn't want visitors to their companies because they had policies in place to try to protect their workforce. And that was totally understandable. That said, we were not going to be able to deliver a fully diligenced, fully financed package unless we comforted ourselves that we could see the factories, do the work that we wanted to do in order to understand what the opportunity set was for us going forward, unless we went and visited in person. And so we divided up into smaller teams and 
fanned out across the network of facilities and figured out ways to work within the company's various policies in different areas. Whereas that sometimes in a normal process would happen over a longer period of time, or it would happen towards the end of a process. In, in our case, we had to get that done very quickly and we had to divide up into smaller teams to get it done. What was that stress like traveling during that time? Everybody was appropriately cautious at the time. At that point, One Rock as an institution had already started to come back to the office and work out of our office. We recognize institutionally that we work better as a team in the same locations. So actually during COVID, we hired a consultant who is a doctor in the infectious diseases area to make sure that if we have people that are coming to the office, that we make sure that we have our desks spaced apart in the appropriate way, that we have the right air exchange, and that if we have to do business travel, how should we go about doing that? So those are precautions that we already had in place. And so by that time during COVID, most of our team was already comfortable getting back out on the road and traveling, even though some of our peers in the financial industry, I think, were a little bit more hesitant. So you mentioned you had to submit this bid on January 15th, and there was a rushed process. What was that like over the holidays? It was definitely a busy holiday season that year. I think the partners who were leading that deal would tell you that that was ultimately one of the differentiating factors for us, because our understanding is that some of the competitors in that deal were overseas buyout firms that maybe prioritize holidays a little bit more. Not that we don't prioritize holidays, but I think there's a common understanding amongst the people at One Rock that if there's stuff we've got to do during the holiday season, we got to do it. I think ultimately it was a very busy holiday season, but gosh, this was a transformational deal for us institutionally. It was much larger than any buyout that we'd ever done before. And so the stakes were too high to just sort of sit back and take the holidays off. Once you reached the agreement, what were the terms of the transaction? It was an all cash purchase price and it was financed with about a billion three of equity. And the rest was a combination of syndicated bank loans and high yield debt. Purchase price was around eight times EBITDA. How have you thought about financial leverage? The leverage market has been good to us. When we did this deal, we conservatively got six times leverage for this business when we bought it. And it's a fairly attractive financing package, one that I'm not sure we could replicate today. But given that it was a financial package with no covenants, we had a syndicated loan market that was fairly open at the time. So we had no maintenance covenants on our senior debt and high yield, which has no maintenance covenants. We felt comfortable levering this six times. And the good news is the company generates lots of cash. So it provides that margin of safety to be able to pay down debt. Once you reached the price, January to March sounds like a pretty condensed window to finalize a deal. So what was that period of time like? That was sort of the second sprint to get done. We had to obviously syndicate our debt. We had to do our antitrust review, make sure that that went well, and put the fine points on some of the transition services to make sure that we were going to be up and running. We needed to reach out to the people that we wanted involved in the whole transition away from Nestle, filling in some of those operational roles that we knew we needed going forward and put in the management equity plan and things like that. So it was a pretty condensed period of time, but we really wanted to meet the seller's time frame here because that's what differentiated us in the process. And actually for us, that's one of the areas that we think we do really well institutionally is that in these corporate carve-out situations, sometimes timing is more important to the seller than price. And because Nestle had set up this time frame in order to get the deal done by the end of Q1 in 2021, we felt like because we were ready to go by January 15th, that's ultimately what won the day for us. That's one of the few areas in the landscape of private equity today where value guys like us can operate effectively is these corporate carve-outs where sometimes once the strategic directive has been made from the parent company, at that point, the time clock is ticking and they need to demonstrate to the market that they can actually follow through and show progress towards an announced divestiture. And 
if you contrast that with a private equity owned company, yeah, they're in a hurry and they want to transact on a timely basis, but price is super, super, super important. Whereas for some of these corporate carve out situations, the parent company doesn't need every last dollar of price. What they need to demonstrate to the market is certainty. That plays well for guys like us who have the operating team to be able to execute these complex deals and to our valuation strategy, where we're trying to buy things at generally around eight times EBITDA. So knowing that they had that time frame and that price might not be the most important consideration when you're bringing this full package to them, how did you think about negotiating the price? Well, we knew that eight times EBITDA was already a pretty nice discount relative to what most beverage companies trade for, what most spring water companies have traded for historically. And so that already reflected a pretty sharp price in our opinion. We try to be as transparent as possible to the intermediary community, let them know where we are every step of the way in the process so that there are no surprises at the end. We think that's one of our competitive advantages. So when we showed up fully financed with that price, we knew we would stand behind it. And offering that certainty ultimately ended up being the most important consideration, I believe, from Nestle. So once you've bought the business, you're now starting to roll through your game plan. And you mentioned as a first piece needing to rebuild the management team. How did you go about that? So during the due diligence process, we teamed up with an industry expert who we had come to know, a guy by the name of Dean Metropolis, who is a legendary guy in the food and beverage area. Dean is the one credited with turning around such iconic brands as Pabst Blue Ribbon, Chef Boyardee, Hostess. So we knew Dean was an excellent operator in reinvigorating brands that needed reinvigoration, and that was this kind of opportunity. Around Dean, we had our own operating partner team. We have industry experts who have trafficked in the food and beverage area for quite some time. And then we have our functional experts. So we have a group that works on IT and can own that particular work stream as we're building out our own IT infrastructure. We have supply chain. We have human capital and organizational development. We have sales. We have finance and HR. So all of the various functions that you might need in order to supplement the assets that you're getting in terms of setting up the infrastructure, we knew we could execute on. And that in combination with Dean gave us all the tools that we needed from a leadership standpoint in order to get this deal done and started on the right trajectory. So in that first year, what are some of the key initiatives that you brought to the business? So I mentioned leaning out the operation and making it more efficient. So we did pursue a sale leaseback of the real estate, and that unlocked quite a significant amount of value there. We started to look at the supply chain and started thinking about, okay, how can we lower the costs of some of the key raw materials here, some of the key inputs that we need, things like bottle caps. We started to think about how can we source from a more efficient supplier and not necessarily just go with whatever the corporate directive was from Nestle historically. We started to think about a sales and marketing strategy. How are we going to figure out how to reinvigorate Pull and Spring? What's the right marketing strategy there? It's probably not TV ads at two in the morning, which is something that I would see during due diligence. So we needed to rethink our entire marketing strategy. And then we tried to think about ways to premiumize the product mix. And we did a small add-on acquisition not too long after we bought the business, a business called Saratoga. And Saratoga makes bottled water that goes into restaurants. They have these iconic blue water bottles that you may have seen if you're in the northeastern part of the U.S. It's very much a regional business. But we thought if we got our hands on that brand, that we could roll it out more broadly across North America. And so we're in the process of doing that now. And so tilting the product portfolio more towards premium brands and then reinvigorating the R&D effort. So one of the things that we started to develop was a sense of what areas of the market could be interesting for product innovation. And one of the more recent brands that we launched was in the collagen water space, which is something that a lot of folks use to bring you healthier skin. Among your efforts in the marketing 
to sort of reinvigorate the brand. What did you do? So we revamped their website for sure. That was one of the first things that we wanted to tackle. We wanted to portray a sense as to where these brands had come from and hearken back to, for example, what Poland Spring was at its founding and sort of what is the DNA of Poland Spring. It's not a Nestle product, it's Poland Spring. So what does that mean to consumers and what is the value proposition there? Same with Arrowhead, same with Ozarka, et cetera. And so we wanted to make sure that we were accurately portraying what the value proposition is for these various brands. We also wanted to make an imprint as it related to all the things that the company's doing from a sustainability standpoint, because we know that's super important to many of our consumers of these brands to provide that understanding of what kind of steps do we take in terms of water stewardship? What kind of steps are we taking in terms of single-use plastic bottles? And how are we trying to transform the company to meet more stringent regulatory standards and frankly, just consumer standards overall? It's those kinds of things that we started with. And then we started to think about how can we get the appropriate social media presence? And, and that's an area that, frankly, the business historically had not done a good job of. And so working with our sales and marketing operating partners, working with Dean and his team, and just really coming up with a solid strategy there as to how do we launch new products and how do we get younger consumers excited about some of the innovations that we're doing with flavored waters or with carbonated waters, those kinds of things. That was the bulk of our efforts in terms of reinvigoration of the brands and understanding if we were to spend money in these areas, what is the likely payback? You mentioned earlier there was a price discount compared to some of the peers and now you're spending money to change the perception of the brand. What did you do with price? That's a really good question, Ted. I mean, we have raised price over the last couple of years. That has mostly just offset the inflationary pressures that we've been seeing at the company. So as the price of fuel and the price of PET has gone up, price of labor has gone up, and certainly we are subject to the same inflationary pressures as many of the other beverage manufacturers who've also had to raise price. So I can't say that we've made a lot of progress in terms of narrowing that 70 cent gap, but it remains an opportunity and something that we'll address in the future. But we have had to offset our inflationary pressures with some price. Some of your first initiatives with the business, how's that translated into financial performance in the early years? Financial performance has done really well in the first nine months as a result of being able to unlock value with the sale lease back and some of the cash flow that's been generated from the business has been on a positive trajectory. And part of that is due to the fact that it's a super stable industry. It grows at, call it 4 to 6% per year. It was a little depressed during COVID, as I mentioned, but things seem to be rebounding quite well. So that's created a nice tailwind for us in terms of financial performance. And then on top of that are all the operational initiatives that we've been doing to lean out the business or to lower the costs and pricing. Hopefully, we will continue to make some progress there as well. How is the operating margin netted out? You mentioned spending more in marketing, spending more in R&D, operational efficiencies, looking for cost efficiencies. Where is that all shaken out in terms of operating margins compared to when you bought it? It's pretty stable in terms of relative to where we bought it. But obviously, with the revenue uplift, that's meant a higher EBITDA performance. What have you seen in the market for bottled water, both as you're reinvigorating this brand and market share, and then you have things like liquid death? Yeah. which comes out of left field, yeah. totally different brand. Yeah, it's a really cool product, isn't it? It looks like a beer can, but it's actually just water. There are things like that that provide various value propositions to consumers all the time, and we definitely want to be a part of that. So we have relaunched brands like Splash, where it's a flavored water that's meant for a slightly different demographic than Poland Spring. And that effort to innovate continues. We have tinkered with some packaging. We have one product in particular named Origin, which used to be really part of Poland Spring, but it's a spring water that is in a 100% recycled plastic bottle. It has the characteristics where it would potentially compete against like a Fiji or one of the other waters. And yet, because it's 100% recycled plastic, because it's sourced locally and delivered locally, it doesn't have the same 
carbon footprint as somebody like Fiji or Aquapana, where it's bottled in a far off land, transported across an ocean and ends up on our shores. So for people that really care about sustainability, it's just a different value proposition that we're able to offer. And so we're in the process of rolling Origin out across North America. What have been some of the bumps in the road in the early going? Certainly the inflationary pressures were something that we had to contend with. The carve out itself, I would give us like an A minus grade, but some of the aspects of the carve out were certainly complicated and took longer than what we had anticipated. We finally cut over on our own IT system 18 months after we bought the business. So we're happy to be standalone today, but that's a lengthy process to be reliant on a parent company for some of the information that you need to make optimal decisions to run your company. And just the size and scope of this company made the IT extraction process and the cutover a little bit more complicated than the average corporate carve out. When you look at how you derive your returns from a business like this, or a couple of the characteristics you mentioned, fairly steady revenue growth, not explosive, but steady, fairly steady margins. How do you think about the way that you'll make your money in this particular deal? The way we underwrite our opportunities is that we try to come up with a relatively conservative set of projections, and hopefully that models out to the kinds of returns that our investors expect over a four to six year time frame. We try not to layer on top of that multiple expansion, which can happen when you buy a business at a discounted multiple because of all the problems that you inherit with it. And if you're successful in cleaning up all the mess, you get to go sell at a market multiple and there should be some multiple uplift when you go to sell that business. Likewise, we try not to factor in the vast majority of the operational improvements that we think we can bring to that particular opportunity. So the set of projections tends to be on an as-is, where-is basis, fairly conservative growth based on whatever we're seeing in the market. And obviously, we expect to do much better than that. In this particular deal, I would imagine that there will be a pretty significant uplift in the multiple that we sell the business at. Now that we have set up the business as an independent standalone entity and put it on the appropriate growth trajectory and have worked through all the complexities of the carve out itself. And then the other half or so will come through the EBITDA improvements that we brought to the business by leaning out the manufacturing, reinvigorating the sales, et cetera, et cetera. So historically in One Rock deals, it's been both of those things and we would expect that here as well. The onset of this deal process, you mentioned you were at least initially from the banks, effectively shut out of the deal because you weren't big enough. How do you think about the appropriate size of your business, of the deals you're looking at, so that you can play in the deals you want, but you're not maybe too big to be competing on every single deal? Yeah, it's something that we think about a lot. And we, first and foremost, are looking for the opportunities that match up against our skill set. There's nothing inherently about our strategy that says, oh, you can only do this rehabilitation of complex situations for businesses that are only between 15 and 40 million of EBITDA. That's simply not the case. So whether the business is 500 million of EBITDA or 15 of EBITDA, we want to see those opportunities because we feel like if we can have an impact and generate the sustainable returns for our investors, those are the kinds of things that set up well for our strategy. And so historically, we're sort of undaunted by size. When we learned about this deal and the size and scope of this deal, we thought, wow, the criteria set up really, really well for us. And it means we're going to have to get a lot of co-invest, but we can definitely do it. We've demonstrated the ability to punch above our weight class in the past. And so we don't want to be excluded from anything just simply due to size. What are your biggest lessons learned from the deal? The biggest lesson, which actually was reinforced in this deal, is that when a seller is telling you to show up with fully financed bids on a certain date, you should do it. That could end up positioning you really well in a process, especially if you have a motivated seller who has a time frame in mind. I think one of the lessons is that it's okay for us to shoot for bigger opportunities if we think they set up well for us. That's a lesson that continues to be reinforced as One Rock evolves in its trajectory. We shouldn't be afraid of going after larger opportunities if 
we feel like we have all the capabilities to execute on those deals well. All right, Scott, one last question for you. What is your favorite aspect of private equity? My favorite aspect of having invested in private equity for the last 25 or so years is really the ability to have a significant impact on the businesses that we buy and truly transform them. And especially given our strategy where we're buying things that are a little ugly, hairy, messy. And hopefully by the end of it, it's much less ugly, much less hairy, much less messy. And it's a nice, clean business that somebody else is going to want to own. And you've had that impact on that business. Scott, thanks so much for sharing the Blue Triton, Poland Spring, Deer Park, and other water stories with us. Thank you, Ted. Super fun. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time.